All right, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to continue our studies in the book of Romans and chapter 8. Uh, this morning we're going to uh, begin in verse 10, and we're going to read down through verse 23 together. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The last time we studied this passage together, we were look, uh, studying particularly uh, verse 17. Uh, we were looking at, the, we considered the sufferings mentioned in verse 17. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And since, and what, last time we, we went over is that it would seem inconsistent with this, in this passage if God were talking about a condition upon blessing of being glorified together with Christ, if that was conditioned upon us suffering some particular type of suffering with Christ. Instead, uh, everything that we've been told in the book of Romans up to this verse that God has promised us or given us is given to us by God's grace and it's given to us in Christ. And it would again seem inconsistent that some condition or performance requirement would be given in order to receive God's blessing here at this point in the context of this chapter. Especially since the context here is being glorified together with Christ as a joint heir of Christ. So it would seem strange that if we're glorified together as a joint heir with Christ, that only those who do some particular type of sufferings would be glorified together with Christ as a joint heir. You're either a joint heir and receiving everything because of what Christ accomplished and paid for on the cross of Calvary, or you're not. Uh, everything God gives us is undes undeserved and only received because of God's grace. And the cost was paid at the cross by our Savior, and it's all part of God's eternal purpose, and everything about this is designed to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ for what He accomplished. It's His accomplishment that results in the glorification, and we take part in that because we're identified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding the, this chapter introduces the idea, I actually began with chapter 6 of Romans, that he, Paul mentions 
in dealing with the issue of shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid, how should we that are dead with Christ, buried and raised with Christ is the issue. We're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection according to Romans 6 and according to Colossians 2. Uh, but understanding who and what God has made us in Christ and appreciating the significance of being identified together with Christ is required to be able to access that grace by faith to acknowledge it in our walk as believers and be empowered by this understanding in our walk. None of it is deserved. None of it is conditional. It's all the result of who and what God has made us in Christ. Now the verse does say, uh, in verse 17 again, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now there's the issue of sufferings and glory in the passage, being identified with Christ in his sufferings, uh, in sufferings and in the glory. Now, our spirit being identified together with Christ by God's Holy Spirit when, uh, happened when we trusted the gospel. The moment you trust the gospel, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That happens being identified with, with the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ by God's Holy Spirit. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That takes place the, the moment we trust the gospel. And when we trusted the gospel, God the Holy Spirit places us in Christ, and that's how we are made righteous, is being made righteous in Christ. That's how our spiritual nature is regenerated. That's how it is that God the Holy Spirit indwells our spiritual nature. And uh, everything that, that Christ accomplished on the cross we're identified with him in that death, burial, and resurrection. And, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ indwells us. Uh, we're identified again with him, and we are accepted in the beloved. And that's how we're made joint heirs with Christ to begin with, is that we are, by, by God the Holy Spirit, identified with Christ and accepted in the beloved. Go with me to Romans chapter 8 and begin reading with me now in verse 9. We're going to read down through verse 15 uh, with, with the understanding, again, with, this, with the thought of being identified together with Christ. Verse uh, 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. God the Holy Spirit lives in us as believers in our regenerated spiritual nature that's made perfectly righteous in Christ. Now, if, he, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You're an unbeliever. If you don't have God the Holy Spirit living in you, you're not saved. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, this, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So Christ lives in our spiritual nature along with God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. Uh, and dwells us. Verse 11, through, through the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Drop, drop down now to verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The Lord Jesus Christ is in us. Uh, we're identified together with him, and nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as believers. In verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The glorification that we share with Christ is part of God's eternal purpose. And all things, no matter what happens in this life, all things God is going to accomplish his purpose of identifying us together with Christ and raising us together with Christ at the rapture and being a part of God's eternal purpose seated with Christ 
in the heavenly places experientially. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places now, according to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, but again, you have God's eternal purpose being mentioned here, and all things working together for good uh, f um, for those who are called according to His purpose. Verse 29, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. God foreknew all those who would be identified together with Christ as members of the agency, the body of Christ, corporately, would be conformed to the image of His Son. We were foreknown in the body of Christ, as members of the body of Christ. Uh, not individually, but corporately. He says here, all those that, that are identified with Christ, God foreknew, would be for, uh, conformed to the image of His Son, that He, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them he also called, were called by the gospel, were saved by sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Uh, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified or declared righteous. And whom he justified, notice, them he also glorified. We are glorified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Notice, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, as a reference to the sufferings that we endure, uh, being identified together with Christ, the sufferings we endure living in this present evil world. For thy sake we're killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than con conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're identified together with Christ, so we are going to, as joint heirs, we're going to be glorified together with Christ, but there's the sufferings that we endure in this life. We as believers, as we discussed last time, are not sheltered or told that God is going to shield us from the sufferings of living in a sin-cursed creation. We will, if the rapture doesn't happen, prevent it, we will all die. We're going to, as an Adam, all die. We're going to die the death that, that every son of Adam with an old sin nature will face. And also there's the sickness and the infirmities and so forth. And we'll look, look at that in a minute. But as God indwells us, he will never leave nor forsake us. Um, Again, Romans, I'm just going to read the, the verse again. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. When we suffer, he suffers with us. Uh, go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, or chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Familiar passage. For time, time's sake, we're going to keep it to the three verses here, but... It's a good chapter if you want to read the whole chapter. Uh, the whole chapter is a great chapter to read. Uh, of course, the book of Hebrews is not written to the church, the body of Christ, directly as, a, as a, one of our epistles, but we can cer certainly make this application. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5, Let your conversation, your manner of life, be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have ruled over you and who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. 
So the, the verse says, uh, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I don't know if you've considered that verse. Um, someone who uh, might feel alone in this life has the promise from the Lord that he'll never leave nor forsake you. Uh, Romans chapter 8, we just read basically the same thing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're identified together with him. Uh, we have God's Holy Spirit indwelling us. When we suffer, he suffers with us. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. You are made perfectly righteous in Christ. Your spiritual nature is, is perfectly righteous. But we suffer in a sin-cursed world along with those who haven't been made righteous in Christ or justified. And in that sense, we don't suffer because we deserve the curse in our inner man. Our old nature has the old sin nature. It's going to suffer and die, and the only way to put it off is through death or resurrection. But uh, God, when he addresses us in Romans 8, he's addressing the inner man, who we are in Christ. Colossians 1, verse 24, that, in that sense, we've received the spirit of adoption. Uh, we're accepted in the beloved. We're complete in Christ. Colossians 1, uh, verse 24. <clears throat> Who now, um, we'll begin reading in verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. There's the filling up which is behind of, this, of the afflictions of Christ. That reference is a reference to sufferings that we as the body of Christ endure in this world. Uh, as long as we live in a world um, in which Satan is the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, he has a, uh, an agenda against the church, the body of Christ. The world doesn't love us because it didn't love Christ. There's sufferings that are associated with just being a believer who professes to believe uh, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and, but especially to those who profess to believe in the doctrine that God has committed to us through our Apostle Paul. There's special sufferings for a member of the body of Christ who uh, rightly divides the word of truth. There's alienation from a lot of Christendom who don't appreciate the fact that we rightly divide the word of truth. So there, there is sufferings if you acknowledge the message that God is ministering today or proclaiming today in the world. If you stand in the purity of that message, recognizing the distinction of the Apostle Paul and that message given him distinct from the message the Lord gave to Peter and the eleven, there's going to be additional sufferings that filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ what Christ, the sufferings you endure, being associated or identified with his message for the world today. Uh, so in that sense, we suffer. Uh, he goes on to say, if you're still there in, in Colossians chapter 1, we just read verse 24, verse 25, whereof I, Paul, made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is your hope of glory? Any special works that you do or special sufferings? Your sufferings, I mean, your hope of glory is Christ who is your hope, is in you. That is your hope of glory. Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. 
Now we are glorified according to, go back now to Romans chapter uh, 8 now. Um, there's this uh, being identified together with Christ as a joint heir with Christ that we're going to be glorified together with Him. The verse says, chapter 8, verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. And then Paul mentions the sufferings of this present time in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which might be revealed in us. Is that what the verse says? The glory which may be revealed in us. If, if verse 17 is conditional, then it's not guaranteed. But verse 18 says, the glory which shall be revealed in us. That glorification that is we share in because we take part in what Christ <laughs> receives as a result of His finished work at Calvary, that we've been made righteous in Him and been identified together with Him. But, but there's that glorif glorification there, this, the glory. That's not the first time, go to Romans 5 verse 2, that's not the first time Paul mentions this glory that we're a part of and we have a hope. Now our hope as believers uh, is not a hope so, gee I hope one day I will be. Our hope is a confident expectation of a sure thing that which we have because of who God has made us in Christ. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1 of Romans, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, notice, and rejoice in hope of what? Of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of a glory that we, we have been identified with Christ that we're going to receive because of His grace. And that hope is something that's to sustain us through the sufferings. That's how it's used in this passage in Romans 8 that we've been studying. It's used to encourage us to look forward to the glory, contrasting the sufferings of this present time with, it, it can't be compared, he says, with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We're to steadfastly look for that glorification we're not to doubtingly wonder if we've done enough in order to receive it as though it was conditional upon our individual suffering. Uh, go with me to 1 Peter. I want you to look at some verses with me. We're going to run out of time this morning. We'll have to pick up here next time. We'll go as far as we can. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. I want to just go through some passages with you about the, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, it, that belongs to Him, that believers are identified together with Him. And we have the hope of, 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 of being uh, together with Him when He's glorified. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 uh, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of, our, uh, of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with unspeakable, uh, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets, which inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now the salvation, First uh, Peter is talking to that believing remnant, as it goes through the, the, uh, this portion of the scriptures we find 1 Peter in, begins with Hebrews, and goes through the book of Revelation. After 
uh, the catching away the church, the, the body of Christ, our epistles are found in Romans through Philemon, after we're caught up at the rapture, there's the, uh, the, the program will revert back to the prophesied or the prophetic program. The conclusion of Israel's prophetic promises will take place during that last seven years of the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel, and so forth. Peter, talking about that day, he said that the prophets back here in time past did not, could not see a, the time period that would uh, separate the sufferings of Christ. And we know the sufferings of Christ take place here at Calvary and the glory of Christ that the prophets talked about that would come at his second coming. The prophets didn't, didn't see a, uh, a, a marked separation between the sufferings and the glory of Christ. Matter of fact, if you read in prophetic scriptures, a lot of times they're inverted or folded in together. You see passages that are talking about the second coming and the glory involved, and then it will talk about the sufferings of Christ in, in, the, in, in verses that immediately join to that. So the, the, they weren't shown when they were given the prophecies about the first and second coming how much time would be between those comings. Uh, we know God interrupted the prophetic program when he revealed the dispensation of grace and his purpose to raise up the church, the body of Christ. In this uh, age, we call it the dispensation, of, or the scriptures call it the dispensation of grace. We call it the church age. Today, uh, during this time, uh, we're holding back, the long-suffering God is holding back that time of wrath and judgment that will come upon the world following, immediately following the rapture of the church, uh, the body of Christ. But Peter says there's the sufferings of Christ and the glory. Uh, go with me to Isaiah chapter 44 now, verse 23. In uh, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was given revelation about the glory that would come after the sufferings of Christ. And we're going to look at chapter 44 of Isaiah, and we're going to begin reading in verse 21. 44. Verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art, um, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Referring to Israel. Uh, in verse 23, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Notice God is going to be glorified in Israel, in redeemed Israel. Verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, Ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Uh, then, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shalt be laid. God's purpose is going to be accomplished in Israel. All the promise, promises that He gave to uh, Israel through their father Abraham, uh, and, and through Moses and through David, all those things are going to be fulfilled. God's purpose will be accomplished uh, at His second coming when He will be glorified in Israel. He's going to be glorified because of what He accomplished to redeem Israel and put, make Israel righteous is, Israel, that, that righteous nation that receives the inheritance that God promised uh, in the earth to that nation and, and to, the, uh, to the saints of that kingdom program. Uh, go to Isaiah now chapter 49. So this is the, the glory of Christ, the sufferings and the glory. This is the glorification that will take place at the second coming. Chapter 49 now, and beginning in, uh, look at uh, verse 3. Notice, 
And he saith unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. We're going to have to stop there. We'll pick up there uh, next week. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's um, an exciting subject to talk about the glory, the suffer sufferings of, and the, well, not the sufferings, but so much, but the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ that we take part in. Uh, the sufferings, part of living in a sin-cursed world, uh, it's given to us on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name's sake. Uh, so we know that sufferings are part of our life as believers, yet, so many churches uh, don't teach that. They, they teach that, uh, that sufferings uh, only happen to believers if they uh, have sinned and they're out of the will of God. And then that's when, that's the only time that, you know, sickness and, and sorrow and, and problems are going to come in the life. It's only as a result of God's immediate chastening and so forth. And that's just not true. That's, that's saying that we live under performance-based acceptance before God and that all the bad things that happen only happen to us, those that are being chastised of the Lord. And yet that's not what is taught. We, we understand what is taught is we don't deserve any of God's blessing, but we're made complete in Christ, lacking nothing the moment we trust the gospel. All that we have is because of who God has made us in Christ. And God sees us as the in, inner man that God's made us in Christ. When our flesh fails, when we choose to uh, make this bad decisions because our old sin nature tempts us, tempts us, and we, and we follow after it, and we do bad things, say bad things, so forth. Uh, Galatians 5 then uh, is invoked, and the, uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the things that come to sowing to your flesh. So there's that suffering that comes from making bad decisions. That God doesn't shield us from those. They happen as a result of, of our bad choices. You decide to smoke, God's not going to pre prevent you from getting lung cancer. You decide to abuse food, God's not going to prevent you in, in, from getting diabetes or other uh, diseases associated with obesity. Bad health, that you make bad choices, God's not going to protect you as a believer from that bad health. So it's, it's the, the sowing, what you reap, you're going to sow, the repercussions of, of sinful things. But we also suffer just because we live in a sin-cursed world, don't we? We suffer because uh, the car breaks down. We suffer because of random things that happen, uh, random to everyone, everybody who lives in this world. Uh, you know, there, there are those that say God doesn't uh, do random things uh, and, you know, or, or chance or, or random things don't happen because God is sovereign and he's control of all circumstances. And they believe that they give God glory by saying that he as sovereign manipulates and controls everything that happens in this world. If not, they think that if you don't say God is control in, in control of everything that happens and every outcome, 
then you're not giving God glory for being God. And yet, if you believe that, then you believe that every child that's in a cancer hospital that's dying of cancer is, in, is, is there because the sovereignty of God decided to afflict that child with that pain or that suffering. Every time a child is abused, that the sovereignty of God de decided to afflict that child that abuse. And so if you assign God the responsibility of every bad thing as well as every good thing that happens, then you're not glorifying God. You're, you're doing the opposite. You're saying the opposite of what he says in his word, aren't you? So we suffer because we live in a sin-cursed creation. The result of Adam and Eve taking part in that fruit, we receive the sin nature, the curse the, that's put upon all creation. That's what Romans 8 is talking about. The sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And, and we'll study that on later in the chapter. But he talks about all creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. We suffer because of that first, that original sin, and that's because of our suffering. Uh, let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your precious word that gives us light to be able to walk in, if we choose to walk in that light, that we can understand your purposes for us today in this age of grace. We can understand how you operate. We thank you for letting us understand that when we access by faith your word and walk in it, that it is sufficient for all our need in this time of suffering, that the sufferings aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, that we have the bright hope of the understanding you give us in the message you've given us today of knowing that all those blessings are ours because of who you've made us in your son and will never be taken away from us. And it's associated with Christ's glory that he receives when we're glorif glorified together with him. We thank you, Lord, for the saints that gathered together this morning around your word. We thank you for your word and the power that it has when we access it by faith and walk in it. For it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray and give thanks. Amen. We'll uh, see you next week. gospel, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God the Holy Spirit takes that, moment, that, that sinner who simply realizes I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. When the Holy Spirit sees that that believer recognizes that they're worthy of death, the wages of sin is death. They're worthy because of their sins of God's judgment, the wrath of God. But they trust in what Christ did on the cross as the only payment for their sins, and that alone, to be accepted with God. God the Holy Spirit sees that faith, and he takes that spirit of that unbeliever, and he does the work of God upon it that identifies you with Christ and seals you into Christ. Now, why is that important? 2 Corinthians, and I told you, I'm going to quote it. I don't want you to turn to it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The whole purpose of the discussion you know, about God's going to judge unbelievers by their deeds, by their sins, 
is that you lack unrighteous or you lack righteousness, having a sin nature. You need God to make you righteous. The way God makes believers righteous is by putting them in Christ and giving you his righteousness. So when you stand before God, the reason why you can be accepted before God by simply believing that when he died on the cross, he paid for your sins, is when God sees you resting in that simple gospel message, he puts you in Christ, and in Christ, you're righteous. And so God's going to judge you on the basis of his righteousness, not your, fail, your failures and your inability to do good 100% of the time. He's not going to judge you for your failing and your sins because he paid for that on the cross. Let's uh, bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you're not going to judge believers according to their deeds, their sins, because you've already judged our sins at Calvary. When you made Christ to be our sin for us, who Christ knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for a simple gospel message. It seems simple to us, but it cost you everything. It cost you your son, the humiliation of being crucified by a bunch of sinful men and humiliated, mocked and spitted on and, and all the horrible things they did to hang on the cross for several hours and, and to have all his blood flow from his body in order to save, atone us, pay for our sins, redeem us. Father, we're thankful that it's simple for us to believe and receive the gift, but it wasn't simple for you or your son. We thank you for loving us that much that you're willing to send your son to die for our sins. And it's in Christ's name we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you for coming.